Have you ever stopped to think about what happens after we die? Many cultures and religions around the world have their own ideas about what life after death is like. But what if I told you that even among these diverse beliefs, there is a common point? The idea that, in some way, we continue to exist. Now, imagine what this post-death state would be like. What do you think people do? Do they rest eternally in peace or continue their journeys in another form? And more intriguingly, do they know that they have died? The Bible has a particular view on this. It suggests that God deeply knows the state of the dead. Isn't that fascinating? Think about divine omniscience, which even encompasses knowledge of what happens in a realm that is a mystery to us. What impact does this perspective have on how we live our lives today? Does it change the way we see death and what comes after? Reflect on this a bit. Perhaps the answer is not as simple as it seems. And in the end, are we prepared for what we will find after the last breath? Let's explore the phenomenon of death from a Christian perspective, interspersing biblical teachings to deepen our understanding of this inevitable event in human life. Death is often seen merely as the end of physical life, a full stop in our earthly existence. But does everything really end there? What does the Bible tell us about the fate and continuity of the soul after death? In Ecclesiastes 12.7, we find a view of what happens when we die, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. This verse reminds us that while our physical body returns to the earth, our spirit, the essence of who we are, returns to God. Here, death is described not as an absolute end, but as a transition of the soul back to the presence of God. Furthermore, 2 Corinthians 5.8 offers comfort by stating, We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. This suggests that for the faithful, death is the beginning of a new existence in the presence of God, free from earthly limitations. But what does this mean for us today? Reflecting on these teachings can change the way we live our lives. Knowing that our stay on earth is temporary and that an eternal existence awaits us, we are called to live in a way that reflects the values and teachings of Christ seeking a legacy that transcends our physical life. Therefore, death, although it marks the end of our physical presence, is not the end of our existence. It is a passage, a portal, to a new way of being with God, as promised in the scriptures. With this hope, how then should we live our days on earth? How does this affect our priorities, our relationships, and our purposes? Death is a theme that inevitably touches all of us and carries with it immense theological depth, which the Bible addresses with richness of detail and clarity. Let's delve into this topic, using accessible language to unravel these profound teachings. In Genesis, at the beginning of everything, God created Adam and Eve and placed them in the Garden of Eden, a place of perfect communion with Him. However, with the disobedience of eating the forbidden fruit, this harmony was broken. In Genesis 3.19, God says to Adam, By the sweat of your brow you will eat your bread, until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. This passage marks the beginning of human mortality, a direct consequence of sin. Thus, death is presented in the Bible not just as a biological event, but as a consequence of the sin that entered the world. It is a reminder of humanity's flawed and sinful nature and the need for redemption. But the story does not end with death. The Bible gives us concrete hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 22, Paul explains, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. This verse shows us that just as death came through one man, the resurrection of the dead also came through one man. Christ, with his resurrection, conquered death and offered us the promise of eternal life. Our life here on earth, with all its struggles and joys, 
is just a brief chapter of an eternal story that continues long beyond our last breath. How are you living this chapter? Do your actions reflect an eternal perspective, or are they bound to the here and now? Jesus, in his words to the thief on the cross, as recorded in Luke 23, 43, offers a promise of redemption and hope that transcends the darkest circumstances. Today, you will be with me in paradise. This statement reminds us that, regardless of the mistakes we have made, God's mercy is always within reach. Is there something in your life that needs the redemption that only Christ can offer? Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 44, speaks of a profound transformation that we will all face. From a natural body to a spiritual body, this change is not just a future promise. It has real implications for how we live today. Are you caring for your spirit as much as you care for your body? For believers, the promise is a life in the presence of Christ. Paul, in Philippians 1-23, expresses this intense and comforting desire. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. This passage reflects the belief that upon leaving this world, followers of Christ immediately enter His glorious presence, a state of perfect communion and eternal joy. In contrast, the destiny of non-believers is often associated with Hades, described in the Bible as a place of waiting and anguish before the final judgment. Luke 16, 23 gives us a vivid image through the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away, with Lazarus by his side. Here, the separation between eternal destinies is clearly delineated, showing the grim reality for those who do not choose to follow Christ. The resurrection of the dead and the final judgment are moments when these differences become definitive. Revelation 20, 13 to 15, describes this moment with unmistakable seriousness. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. Then, death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. These biblical descriptions are not just distant doctrines, they have direct and profound implications for our spiritual lives and daily choices. How does this understanding of eternal destiny influence how you live today? Are you consciously choosing a path that leads to the presence of God? Just imagine the scene. People from all eras of history, each with their own experience coming back to life in brand new bodies, free from any pain or limitation they had before. Sounds like something out of a movie, doesn't it? But then, the question arises, how exactly would this happen? And more importantly, what would it mean for us today? Does the idea of resurrection influence how we live our days, or is it just a distant belief we hold for an undefined future? At the heart of Christianity, the resurrection is seen not just as the promise of life after death, but as a reality already inaugurated by the resurrection of Jesus. According to the scriptures, such as in 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection of Christ is the first of many, assuring all believers that they too will be revived and transformed into glorified bodies, free from death and sin. This view not only provides comfort, but also motivates the faithful to live a life aligned with the teachings of Jesus, reflecting on the eternal impact of their actions. In Judaism, especially in more orthodox strands and many rabbinic texts, Resurrection is also a recurring theme. The idea that the dead will one day rise again is an integral part of the belief in the coming Messiah and the future world, Olam Haba. This hope for complete renewal and divine justice permeates many Jewish practices and celebrations. The Book of the Dead, a central piece in this belief, was not an ordinary book but a collection of texts that served as a guide to the beyond. These texts included spells, prayers, and detailed instructions to help the dead navigate the complex and dangerous world of the afterlife. Imagine having a map or an instruction manual that guides your way after this life, ensuring that you can reach a state of happy and eternal existence. 
The practice of mummification is also a reflection of the Egyptian belief that the physical body played a crucial role after death. They carefully preserved bodies because they believed that the spirit needed an intact physical vessel to continue its journey in the afterlife. This concern with the preservation of the body suggests a view that death is a transition, not an end, where the body would serve as a house for the spirit in the beyond. Moreover, the grandiose pyramids and tombs they built were not merely graves, but considered portals to another dimension. Each structure was an architectural complex designed to ensure that the king or queen continued to reign even after death. These constructions not only demonstrate Egyptian ingenuity, but also the belief that material life extended into a spiritual sphere. Let's take, for example, the story of Lazarus, a tale that not only demonstrates the power of Jesus, but also offers us a unique view of death. When Lazarus died, Jesus did not announce his death with words of finality or despair. Instead, he said, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. Imagine that, comparing death to a deep, dreamless sleep. In this type of sleep, there is no earthly consciousness, no worries or pain. It is a peace that transcends our daily experiences of agitation and distress. By thinking this way, doesn't it seem like Jesus was trying to tell us that death is not something to fear, but a state of rest, waiting for the moment to awaken? And when Jesus arrived at Lazarus's tomb, he simply called, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus came, as if waking from a deep sleep. This moment is powerful, not just because it shows Jesus bringing someone back to life, but because it illustrates death in a way that all of us can understand and, in some way, find comfort. Death, from this perspective, is just temporary, an interval before an awakening. How do you feel about thinking of death as sleep? For me, it brings a great deal of comfort knowing that the end on this earth may just be a rest, awaiting the voice that will call us to life again. Could this approach change the way we live our lives? Perhaps it might make us more willing to value each moment, to love more deeply, and to live with the hope that in the end, we will just fall asleep to wake up in a new reality, promised and manifested through the resurrection of Jesus. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, before the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, the saints of the Old Testament, those who lived a life of faith, such as Abraham, Moses, and David, did not go directly to heaven. Instead, they waited in an intermediate state, often referred to as Abraham's bosom. This was seen as a place of rest and comfort, but not yet the full presence of God in heaven. Can you imagine what it would be like to be in that place, waiting for the fulfillment of a promise of redemption? Now let's dive into an even more intriguing aspect of this story, Christ's work in Hades. According to various interpretations of the New Testament, after his death, Jesus descended into Hades, also known as the realm of the dead. But why would he do this? The answer is both simple and extraordinary. He went there to free those captives. Ephesians 4.9 mentions that he descended to the lower earthly regions, and the first of Peter 3.19 explains that he went and preached to the spirits in prison. This action by Jesus not only shows his power over life and death, but also reaffirms God's love and justice. All those who were waiting in faith for redemption were not forgotten. Christ went to them, breaking the barriers of death and sin, to ensure that no one who trusted in God would be left behind. This makes us think, if Jesus was capable of such a feat, what does that mean for us today? How does it influence our understanding of death, heaven, and hell? And more importantly, how can it change the way we live our faith on a daily basis? For those who believe and follow his teachings, there is not a lonely wait or an uncertain void after death. Instead, as described in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, we are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. This statement by Paul underscores the confidence and hope we have as believers to be immediately with the Lord after our earthly departure, which is a comforting truth. Moreover, the Christian hope embraces the promise of the future resurrection, 
where our bodies will undergo definitive transformation. This event is vividly described in Revelation 21.4, where it is promised that He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. This verse not only offers comfort, but also gives us a vision of the complete restoration and renewal that awaits believers. In the biblical description of the final judgment, we find a scene of immense magnitude, where everyone, without exception, will stand before God to be judged. For believers, this day brings with it a promise of reward, where the good works done in the name of faith are recognized and celebrated. But, have you ever stopped to think about what this really means? What kind of rewards do you imagine could be given? How might these rewards change the way we live our lives today? On the other hand, for those who did not believe, the final judgment is described as a moment of rigorous evaluation, where every action and decision are scrutinized. It is not just a matter of punishment, but a thorough examination of how each person lived their life in relation to the truth that was revealed to them. What do you think it would be like to stand before that judgment? What would you like to be considered about your life? These questions are not meant to provoke fear, but to inspire deep reflection on our values and behaviors. The final judgment, with its implications of final justice and celebration of good works, challenges us to live more consciously and deliberately. And here's an invitation to reflection. If we know that one day our actions will be evaluated, how does this influence the choices we make every day? Are we living in a way that would make us proud before that divine tribunal? Reflecting on the final judgment and the eternal destiny of each one of us, it becomes evident how crucial our actions and choices on earth are. Life is not just a series of days that pass unnoticed, but a series of opportunities to shape our character and our eternal destiny. Every moment, every decision counts, not only for the here and now, but for what awaits us beyond this life. The Bible tells us that the dead are in a spiritual state, awaiting the final day of judgment and resurrection. This reminds us that our earthly existence is just part of the journey. What we do here resonates in eternity. How are you living your life? Do your daily actions reflect the values you want to take with you? This is not a question to be considered lightly. The promise of a final judgment and resurrection is a powerful reminder that we are made for something greater than just the pleasures and struggles of this world. We are being called to live with purpose, with love, and with a vision focused on eternity. So I invite you to reflect deeply on your own life. How are your choices shaping your eternal future? Are there changes you feel you need to make? Remember, no matter where you are on your life journey, it's never too late to transform your path and seek salvation through faith. May this moment be a turning point for you. May you look at your actions and their impact, not just on your own life, but also on the lives of others. And may you find inspiration and courage to make choices that lead you to a full and meaningful life, knowing that every step you take is bringing you closer to a loving and just encounter with the Creator. If you haven't started this journey of faith yet, why not start today? Why not seek a life that not only fills you with peace and purpose now, but also echoes into eternity? Come, explore what it truly means to live with faith and hope, and discover the joy of a life lived in full expectation of the heavenly promise.